Let me just say that I've lived here a long time and my family's here, my friends are here and in fact my son drove past the Erwan Shrine 15 minutes before the explosion. So what I'm going to say comes not only from the head but also from the heart. What I'd like to do in the 20 minutes or so that I have is to make a few very general points what I'm not going to do is to get into specifics about the actual blast and the word grey wolves will not pass my lips. I think the important thing to remember when we're talking about international terrorism in Thailand is the need to keep it in perspective. Um, I do not see it in any sense as the main primary threat to Thailand's security. Uh, in my own opinion, there are many more serious threats to this country, not least its own political divisions, environmental destruction, the impact of global warming, movements of population, so on and so forth. So everything I'm going to say, I think, needs to be taken in that context. The Erawan Shrine bombing was not, in my opinion, in any way Thailand's 9-11. I don't see it as a watershed. And to the extent I'm going to be controversial here, it'll be in saying that I don't think very much is going to change as a result of it. I, I don't think that what happened marked any fundamental change in the threat of international terrorism in this country, and I would be surprised if it resulted in any fundamental changes to the security structure in this country. And possibly that is where one of the problems lies, and to that extent, I am somewhat pessimistic uh, about the future. Um, I believe and I would be delighted to be proved entirely wrong, but I believe that there is a good chance we'll see more of these events. Um, I doubt if any one of them will 
have the impact that the government is obviously most concerned about, which is, aside from the loss of human life, the impact on the economy and the impact on tourism. I think the Thai tourist industry is an incredibly resilient industry, and I don't think that's going to change. But obviously, any further uh, incidents like this cannot be positive. What I'd like to do to begin with is just to have a brief overview, to give you a very brief overview of stuff which I'm sure many of you know, some of you perhaps don't know so well, which is the trajectory of international terrorist incidents in Thailand that have led to where we are today and why we're here today. And I'll go back initially to March 1993 and the incident, which many people have now forgotten, it's been mentioned since the Erawan Shrine incident in some articles, but the incident in which Ramzi Yusuf, uh, who is now safely behind bars in the United States, was responsible for an attempt to destroy the Israeli embassy in Bangkok. And that attempt involved a truck with approximately one ton of explosives, which is not a small amount. Uh, the fact that it did not happen was pure good luck. There was a minor accident with a motorbike, motorbike taxi, and as a result of that, an argument, a crowd, and the driver of the truck then took off, and the truck was impounded, and a week later, a body was found in it, and the explosives and the incident never happened. Fast forward to August 2003, and we have the Hambali incident, where arguably one of Southeast Asia's most dangerous terrorists was apprehended in Ayutthaya. Um, and that was essentially the result of very close cooperation between the Thai Security and Intelligence Services and America's Central Intelligence Agency. And again, it was a successful operation. Then we come to January 2012 and the arrest of Mr. Atris Hussein, a Lebanese gentleman um, with a Swedish passport who was arrested on the outskirts of Bangkok uh, presiding over a warehouse in which there were four tons of ammonium nitrate. Not just one this time, but we have four tons of ammonium nitrate, which of course is enough if it were in one package to bring down a whole building, particularly if it were in an underground car park. And one has to wonder whether the Israeli embassy, which is not in the same place was not in the same place or is not in the same place now as it was in 93 might have been the target. Now the result or, or rather the reason for Atris Hussein's arrest and the foiling of that plot was uh, liaison between the Israeli intelligence services and the Thai authorities. A month later February 2012, there was the Valentine's Day fiasco in which a group of Iranians attempted to launch attacks against Israeli diplomats and again that attack actually began. One gentleman blew himself up, the others fled, some of them successfully, one was later arrested and the attack was foiled, apparently because the Iranians behind the operation were in a hurry to respond to attacks in Tehran on their own nuclear scientists and clearly the individuals tasked with the operation were what one might describe as a B team, not the A team. Then we move forward to August this year, an attack which was catastrophically successful in central Bangkok, involving apparently Uyghurs from Xinjiang in China, with operating clearly with support from sources in Turkey. 
Had there been any foreign liaison assistance to the Thai authorities, it should have come, of course, from China. But I think we can all safely understand that in this particular instance, the Chinese authorities were caught as much by surprise as their Thai counterparts. Nobody saw this coming. Um, that's a situation which I'm sure is going to change very rapidly, and I have no doubt that for the Chinese authorities, the whole issue of Uyghurs, what's happening in Xinjiang, what's happening in Syria, what's happening perhaps in Turkey, is going to become as central a counterterrorism priority as Hezbollah and Hamas are for the Israeli authorities. What I think is worth pointing out is that in all these incidents, two factors obtrude, two factors are most apparent. One is sheer good luck, and the other is foreign liaison assistance. What we don't seem to be seeing enough of is the Thai security and intelligence agencies themselves proactively foiling attacks before they happen. And of course, counterterrorism is all about preempting attacks. I've been impressed in recent weeks by the investigative resources and skills that the Royal Thai Police has brought to the investigation. And we now have two apparently uh, very much involved individuals under lock and key and the explosives that were in those apartments in Nongjok and Minbury are now safe. However, catching the guys after they've done it is not in any way the same as stopping them before they've done, they did it. And in this case, we've got 20, 20 people dead, 130 wounded, many of them maimed for life. So there is obviously an issue. Why am I pessimistic? Why don't I expect much to change? I think there are, there are, there are two areas which this needs to be looked at in. One of them relates to domestic security in Thailand and what these incidents over the years have highlighted in that regard. And clearly there are huge challenges and huge liabilities, huge vulnerabilities in this regard. Two of them are, as we've seen in this recent incident, closely interrelated. The first is the role in Thailand of transnational organized crime, which since, I, I tend to think of it as a sort of this century problem, it was around in the 80s and 90s, but essentially really grew legs over the last 15 years in this century. And as we all know, international crime organizations, international criminals, from pretty much most major countries in the world are maybe not operating, but certainly in Thailand. And that's a huge liability. The second issue which relates to that is one which um, I think I can articulate with a degree of confidence, but at the same time, it's not something that gives me any pleasure to say, but we all know it, and that's official corruption in this country, which is a, a major problem. And what we've seen in this recent incident is official corruption, which impacts the security services themselves. And what happened on the border at Aranyabratet really underlined that intersection 
of transnational organized crime and official corruption when you have transnational criminals who also happen to be terrorists crossing a border and facilitating that crossing by paying $600 to enter the kingdom. The other huge problem or liability, vulnerability, is Thailand's own domestic political dissensions and I don't want to, it's not my place to make comments about this, but what I will say is that I believe it has a very negative impact on the extent to which resources, manpower, um, attention can be focused on the problem we're talking about this morning. It skews perspectives and arguably it prevents the sort of effective coordination between different agencies that might otherwise take place. Let me turn to the question of external security, which is about knowing essentially what's out there. And I would argue that this, again, is an area of considerable vulnerability. We need to ask the question, are there people out there beyond Thailand's borders that wish to do damage to this country? That's a question. Um, what we do know is there are certainly people out there who see Thailand as a convenient place to wage their own private wars very publicly with loss of Thai lives and loss of foreign lives. So basically what happens in places like Sulawesi, Syria, Peshawar in Pakistan, Karachi, possibly Bangladesh, this matters to Thailand. This can come here and cause huge, huge problems for the Thai government and Thai people. I think when, when, we, when we look at this issue, what, what I see is, is two things. I, I see a lack of awareness and I also see to a degree a, a lack of interest in what's happening in obscure places like northwestern Syria. And I think the reasons for this is because it, it, it relates to globalization and it relates to what I would call an imbalance in the globalization process. And what I mean by that is that the world has discovered Thailand Thailand has had huge success in attracting international tourism, international respect, international interest. Brand Thailand in terms of food, fashion, culture, beaches, you name it. It's, it's a global phenomenon. On the other hand, the other side of the imbalance is that Thailand has been arguably slow in catching up with the world. So the world has come to know Thailand, but to what extent does Thailand really know and understand the world? At one level, this is a it's, it's a cultural thing because there is in this country huge pride and justifiable pride in history, in culture, in the way that Thailand successfully resisted European colonialism. And, and these are sources of great strength to this country. But at the same time, it may be that they are becoming sources of weakness because I think that certainly at the governmental level there needs to be more focus on what is happening beyond 
Thailand's borders. That's, if you like, excuse me, that is, if you like, a, a take on, on the very broad cultural factor. But I think another factor which flows directly from that relates to the external intelligence uh, collection and analysis of the Royal Thai government. When we come to external intelligence, I think it's true to say that there are three agencies, um, perhaps four, which are most active. The Armed Forces Security Center, the National Intelligence Agency, Police Special Branch, and to a lesser degree, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So one needs to ask questions, and it's certainly not for me to give answers because I don't know them, and even if I did, it wouldn't be an appropriate venue to, to voice them. To what extent do different agencies talk to each other? So let's, let's look at the Middle East. I mean, Thailand, in the incidents that I've, I've outlined, has been hit repeatedly by organizations, individuals, from the Middle East, from Syria, from Turkey, from Iran, and, 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 and transient terrorists like Ramzi Yusuf. And I think one needs to ask the question, to what extent is Thailand focusing its intelligence collection efforts in an area which is clearly an area of concern. One might want to pose the question without knowing the answer, and maybe there are other gentlemen on this panel who can give some sense of the answer. I mean, is there in the Middle East one intelligence station, one station in one embassy somewhere in the Middle East, which is staffed by more than one or two individuals, which is looking at that whole increasingly unstable area where threats not just might come from, but are coming from. As I say, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a question which definitely needs to be asked. A related question is, does Thailand need one external intelligence agency. At the moment, we have three, perhaps four. Is it possible, is it desirable that one agency takes over, centralizes the tasks that are clearly re required to, to be looked at? And again, it's, it's not my place to suggest answers, but I think it is perhaps helpful to raise the question. The second side of external intelligence, and I'll wrap up in a minute, the second side of external intelligence is of course analysis. Uh, you can have as many facts as you can gather, but if you can't put them into some rational analysis, it's not a lot of use. So that means that any country needs a corpus of, of, of area experts in whatever area is considered to be a focus of interest. And that means people who have studied the culture, the language, speak the language, people who can put raw data into analytical context and deliver it to government. I would imagine that in the Thai context, the National Security Council is arguably the best repository for such a group of analysts, of, of area experts. And, and to a degree, they already exist. But again, I would pose the question, which other people here are better qualified to answer than I, 
to what extent are those experts A, enough, and B, listened to? So does Thailand need something like the equivalent of Australia's um, Office of National Assessments, ONA, which basically is a group of analysts. They're not intelligence officers, they don't gather information, they have no, no direct role in gathering intelligence, but their role is specifically to analyze it and to give policy suggestions and proposals to government. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it's very easy for foreigners to sit back and to point at loopholes in another country's system. And, and I think that these are questions which Thai policymakers, in the light of what's not just has happened, but what has been happening, obviously that's their, their role. And they have their own perspectives and their own priorities. So in short, I, I, I would end by saying that I am fairly pessimistic. I don't believe that this has been a 9-11 incident and I don't believe that a lot is going to change. But what I do believe is that when it comes to external threats, and this clearly was one, Thailand can do a lot better than relying on good luck and foreign friends. A little bit more adventurous, I think this Erawan incident have huge impact on the internal security governance in years to come. And there will be a big change, and that change will be slower and accelerated. It depends on whether the current leaders are, are in power or not. That's my, that's my take. Now, the reason I want to give you uh, the prequel of the incidents, because a lot of people just focus on the what has happening without understanding what has ha happened. This is something that's out there before the Thai failed to read the whatever symbol that come out of it. I, I try to give you just a short snap of uh, what I think, you know, that has happened before the era one shrine. This is the, I just gave you the image before Elowans uh, tried bombing, this is the image. And this is a Thai headache. And it's not new, but oh no, it's, it's not new because just two and a half years ago, Thailand, for the first time, faced with uh, Vigo. You know, in the past, we don't know the, the Vigo from Xinjiang. We don't know anything. We're just familiar with Rohingya. Uh, we are familiar with uh, Cambodian, uh, with refugees. We are familiar with uh, uh, um, Myanmar. And uh, as you can see, this is the problem brought by Thailand, weak border management system patrol control. And this is one of the biggest problem. And I think the Thai government now realize that this is the major problem and try to uh, uh, fix it. And of course, uh, as, as you can see, uh, end of 2010 uh, and first half of 2014, these are the issue. And now all the vehicles have been repatriated. There's no more uh, in Thailand. But I think in the future, if the borders management on the control is still weak, then I think there will be a new batch. Because uh, there's a lot of uh, internal constraint, internal issue inside Xinjiang in China. This is the route that we are familiar, and I think nobody uh, discussed much, and uh, it's very interesting because it also has to do with the neighboring country as well. But people, as you know, and I think uh, everybody know that Thailand is a country that easy access. Visa regime is a very friendly. You can come in and out. If you don't have visa, you can actually pay up front to get uh, temporarily visa, and that's the fact. And this is a big problem because of late, uh, without border control. As you know, uh, 
uh, Thailand uh, border, we have about 5,432 kilometers. It's easy to remember, 5,432. Uh, the worst is in the uh, Golden Triangle area, where a lot of uh, refugees, a lot of the, uh, asylum seekers came in. And this has been the major problems for, for Vigo. And I draw this just uh, this morning just to see, uh, scrap to see how they come into uh, Thailand. This is the pictures from the newspaper, just try to give you uh, the issue I tried to raise. The Tung Bang Kadeshi, three Vigos are arrested in Aranyapatet on October 2015. According to the Thai police, they are all the same. They are all cat. Cat in Thai means everything, covering the uh, Arabs, the whole Middle East, Bangladeshi, Pakistanis, the Indians, Xinjiang, Turkestan, whatever, Central Asia, CAC. If you look at this picture, there's no distinction, we don't know. And Anthony was correct. When you talk about Middle East, for us, it's pretty mushy. We don't know exactly. Middle East have like over 40 countries, you know, with different cultures. You have uh, Persians, you have Middle East, you have different Saudis, you have that distinction has not yet happened in the mind. So the level of awareness, knowledge of Middle East and everything is the main problem. As this picture, just want to tell you, I uh, just want to tell you that this is exactly what happened. Actually, we, we don't know, we don't understand. And you look at this picture. This is the week where the first batch that came in. Look at the face. It's all very similar to the culprits that have been in the newspaper. They all look very similar. You see, and the Thai cannot make distinction very hard, let alone spell the name in Arabic right. We better learn Arabic and spelling in Thai, in Thai script. I just show you this picture just to show you that, look at this picture, it's all very similar. And this is before uh, things turn bad. And this is how they, they stay in the Songkla, in the detention camp. But people didn't uh, talk about why Vigo has to come to Thailand, why we attract Vigo. Normally, Thailand should not be the place. We, we are attractive to Rohingyas because they want to go to Malaysia. They could not make it. Uh, they stuck in Thailand. That has been always the case. But there were reasons. That is the reason that uh, I tried to share with you. As you know, uh, the corporations and the border administration amongst uh, China's uh, friends within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has been pretty tough. Before that, they don't need to come to Thailand. They just go through uh, this country. And now, suddenly, they found out that it's very uh, good to, to come to this part, easy, because they're very corrupt officers. But there are certain levels of corruption. Uh, I think the worst is uh, uh, in Thai-Cambodian border, you know why, because there are a lot of uh, money transfer. It's not only the immigration, it's also the casino and uh, uh, illicit trade. Um, the rising violence uh, inside Xinjiang and follows uh, various bombing even a few days ago. Uh, and the most important thing that give rise to Thai problem is what happened in Malaysia. Otherwise, all these people should be in Malaysia, not in Thailand. And you want to blame, blame it on Malaysia. That it has not yet really helped much. I say it for a fact. And uh, Mal Malaysia now, I think, has been uh, very helpful to Thailand, try to help solve uh, southern Thailand. But uh, the MH330 tragedy and the suspicious of stranger that led to crackdown then that's, that is why it was at the time when these Uyghur, uh, uh, Uyghur refugees came to Thailand and supposed to pass to Malaysia got stuck. Thailand has nothing to do. They wanted to go to Turkey. The c complication is that we don't know how to deal with this. Because normally we think that, you know, all cat, you know, probably come from Bangladesh. All cat probably come from pa Pakistan, all cats probably are Rohingya, but they are not. Some of them, my gosh, they speak Chinese, they speak Turkish, so that is the issue. 
And just to give you, uh, Thailand is a wonderful country. It's a transit hub for everybody. Ajahn Titinan said it right. It chatters the Thai. The Thai has a belief that we are a friendly country. People love us. They come here eye and eye and plan attack for other country. They won't attack Thai. I think no more. And this, the incident will change the whole thinking, which I think, uh, I think Anthony uh, uh, understood a bit. I think this incident will shape the new securities, internal security uh, governance tremendously. In fact, it has been changing for the past 12 years because of all these uh, uh, slave labor. As you know, this current government tried very hard to improve the trip report, which also has to do with distractions, the smuggling of uh, uh, workers and all that. It's all interrelated. Um, what is interesting also is that uh, the influx of uh, Vigo has caused problems as you know, because it's duplicate the, the route that North Korean uh, asylum seeker has been taking. And in fact, South Korean government has been very worried that uh, the Uyghur will alert the Chinese authority or whoever that uh, taking care of the border that will impede the so-called regular flow. I, I said regular flow because for the past 12 years, Thailand has been one of the largest transit points for North Korean asylum seeker. And this point, uh, nobody mentioned. We were attacked by international communities because of the uh, violations of human rights uh, of uh, Lohinya at sea and many others uh, along the borders. But on this thing, uh, Thailand has, has, has done uh, a, a good job. And I hope that um, with better uh, security and border management in the past uh, 12 to uh, 16 months, there will be race uh, incident uh, this way. This is the, the timeline. Uh, as I said, most of them came in a batch, there are about 500 some, and now they all repatriate. Thailand has been buying time. It used all the techniques it can and tied diplomacy, you know, diplomatic fitness, tried to slow, but in the end cannot. It cannot because of the circumstances, both inside and external uh, factor. I will not dwell on that, but uh, Thailand has to make the decision it has to make. That is sent back. As you can see, other country uh, also sent back the Uyghur, but no big deals, but only in Thailand is big deal under TV, under uh, uh, media, because Thailand is an open society. You cannot hide anything. Uh, media, uh, rightly also, you know, will expose. And this is the issue, and that uh, we have to deal with. You look at the case of Indonesia. Indonesia also face similar. You have vehicles who uh, drip down from Thailand to Malaysia, go through uh, uh, sea, and then end up in uh, Pozo and uh, uh, in Sulawesi, but no news. And I think uh, Thailand should have taken the route of uh, Indonesia by detaining the Vigo instead of sending back. But now that Thailand decides to send back, Thailand has to uh, respond for the consequence which, as everybody know, uh, what happened. And this is very interesting because you have three examples. Send back discreetly, like Cambodia, there were uh, incidents that they found out, there were criticism. Like Malaysia, we have done several times discreetly, newspaper didn't export, or in Thailand, uh, create a big mess out of it, you know. Everything is on show, on TV, live. So I think this is the issue that uh, our policymaker or the security apparatus have to think about it. But I'm, I'm, I'm not supporting the uh, uh, single uh, gate, okay? It's a different notion, okay? Now, what you see in Thailand is not only Thailand, it is, uh, I believe, the regional network. Some sleeping, some are not, and it happened. And I would like to, to, to treat the 
Erevan bombing just, you know, it's an isolated case, but it happened, it happened because of the situation that occurred. So it's interrelated. And the vehicles, I, like many other, including I think uh, some of the Rohingyas, uh, came to Thailand and they can connect it uh, with the existing network of uh, violent extremists that exist before. You probably have heard Jamia Islamia and many other groups that have been active before. Both Thailand and Southeast Asia has been identified at the uh, second front of the uh, battle to terrorism and con continue to do so. And, but the situation has changed. Situation has changed since when? Situation has changed since the tsunami. Tsunami, after the tsunami in Aceh and in Thailand, there's a proliferation of Muslim NGO in, in the, throughout the region, namely Thailand, southern Thailand, and also uh, uh, Indonesia. And I think this is a factor because uh, there are uh, different levels of engagement of a Muslim NGO. I will not go into detail, and it's still very sensitive, and I think the Thai government also uh, lack knowledge of uh, a different type of uh, uh, Islam NGO, because some of them are just mixtures of uh, humanitarian organization, sometimes e very heavily e ideologized. This, I think, Thailand has no clue at all. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes. And then you have also some of the uh, movement, uh, which now are quite popular. I will not name it uh, from Turkey. So I will not go too much, uh, because I think I, I don't want to occupy the time. I have prepared slides that uh, uh, I try to deal with a broader. This is not an issue that uh, Thailand has to tackle isolatedly. Um, this issue in whatever form, whether it's Vigo, it's not only Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, or even to the extent the Philippines, we all have uh, need to work together and also uh, exchange the intel. And I think what is good is that uh, with this incident, Thailand has asked uh, the Indonesians to give some intel, particularly those four who were incarcerated in the uh, um, yeah, in, in Indonesia. That, that was good. I think that should be more uh, a cooperation. And I think, as uh, Anthony pointed out, there is certain pride that uh, uh, local intelligence sometimes, uh, they think that they know a lot, they, they link with the local actors and all that. But now the situation is not that way. It's the regional network that are uh, in places. And I think the vehicles, uh, uh, the network that is uh, happening between Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia is very serious that needs uh, uh, cooperation uh, among the, the ASEAN member. And uh, uh, this slide, I will end here. I want you to look at the red. Uh, this is very interesting because Thailand, as any, again Anthony uh, suggesting whether there will be an intel unit in the Middle East or not, no. But what we are trying to do is to create an environment externally that will uh, ensure that the Thai study abroad will not be radicalized. This is something new. Because now there are fear, and I think ASEAN members are now also cooperating to make sure that the student who study, whether it's in Pasantians, in uh, Northern Pakistan or in uh, normal university like Al Asa in uh, Egypt are having not only good education but also secularized view of uh, Islam so that they come back and contribute to the society they fear. So instead of uh, setting up uh, intelligence community, they set up a kind of system so that the Thai will feel at home when they get sick. They have doctors. That has been the case in the uh, Thai embassy in Egypt. Now. I think the, uh, the cabinet this week will revive the idea whether to, to set up a dormitory for the Thai students study in our uh, uh, university. I think it's a good idea. The idea has been, uh, has been dumb because we, we do not have an intelligent foreign minister previously. So this time it has been reconsidered and I think this is very good. I will end here, thank you very much.
Well, this is a very interesting question, and I think to answer it, I would need three hours because you have to really go uh, deep down the evolution of Thai Chinese relation. But this incident view, I would guarantee, will strengthen Thai Chinese but further because you already have life that were lost. And it also indicate the willingness of the Thai to cooperate with the Chinese on the security issue. And this will also increase the capacity of Thailand as far as China is concerned. This is why I think it's very important to have Thailand to have multilateral assistance on improving the capacity on counter this kind of extremism. As you know, I mean, with respect to the police, we don't have the we, we don't have the stuff, you know, the Thai would say. We don't have the stuff to cope with this. We don't have the forensics uh, standard to really uh, cope with this. Our capacity is very low. But to say it is, it's not, it's not very Thai to admit that up front. But I think this is what's important. And in fact, if you look at Indonesia, and thanks to Ambassador, because uh, we constantly talk about Indonesia, after Bali bombing, improved their capacity of forensic uh, investigation that has promoted them as the leading counter-terrorism since 2002. For me, I think that this incident will and must open up Thailand's security, and we have to strengthen our weakness. We, we have our strength, but international standard is important. Otherwise, we will have only uh, one country that is willing to do more, and you don't want to see that because the threat is come from all around, especially, you know, Anthony already uh, mentions uh, from various places. So Thai Chinese from now on will be even deepened. And I think uh, just like Indonesia, after the Bali bombing, uh, Australian's uh, police commissioner came into Bali, look at the issue, and it's open up. It's no longer something of uh, national sovereignty. It's a good collaboration. And I think this is the trend. I will end here. Thank you.